has said, after you tell Zod, come back and tell me that you told Zod. Right? So we have like a three-phase protocol. But that's cool, right? And so when he comes back, he's like, sweet, it's on, right? But does Zod attack? Remember that Lee wasn't going to attack unless he got that third act. Zod doesn't know that Lee got it. <laughs> so, so Lee, would, it would be a mistake. So if Lee thought this through, Lee would realize that Zod might not attack. Right? So that's not going to work. And the thing about the two days, four days, it doesn't matter how much time. You know, we can all speed it up. We can maybe we could do it over months or years. But it, it really comes down to the fundamental uncertainty. Does anybody have another idea about how we could uh, fix it? Right, what we do? Mm-hmm. Send a thousand horses down. One might get through. Yeah, one might get through. That's cool. So, so what that's done is that sort of increased the probability that we will what? So I don't understand. So I send a thousand horses, and one gets through, and does it come back? They send a thousand horses back. Or, wait, we send a thousand horses. We send a thousand horses back. Okay? And then we send a thousand horses across again, right? We send a thousand horses back. And then a thousand horses back. When do we stop? Five seconds. So I think that doesn't work, right? Like, like that increases the... There's no question that if there's a non-zero probability of a horse getting across, and we send an infinite number of horses, then with probability one, a horse gets across. It has not helped us to decide whether or not we're attacking a dog. Right? Yeah. Is there an answer for this? Huh? Is there an answer for this? Well, there is an answer. Oh. The answer is, it's impossible. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and it's sort of a fundamental impossibility result, because the internet, so this is, what is this an analogy for? This is the cloud, right? <laughs> and this is Alice, and this is Bob. And the two generals impossibility result would appear to say, that in an unreliable network, the networks that we have all agreed we're going to live in for the next eight weeks, it's basically not possible to do anything of use. So, what a drag. So this is the first of, 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 of at least three impossibility results that we're going to study in this class. I mean, don't be discouraged. We still go out there and build distributed systems every day. It's just that there's a lot of stuff that you would think would not only be easy, but would be like, Required to get shit done that you just that you just can't get. Okay. Is there another way to solve this? One way to solve it would be for Zod and Lee to have already known before they started the protocol that they were to attack at dawn. <laughs> that's about all. That's about all you could do. If they knew already, if they came into existence knowing that they were going to attack at dawn, they wouldn't need a protocol and everything would be fine. Do you have a question about this? Um, does a protocol like TCP absolutely solve this? Does so this, that's, a, that, that's a great question, and I was hoping that somebody would ask that. So what does TCP do? TCP, yeah, hmm? Oh, uh, no, sure, answer it. What does TCP do? gives us ordered and reliable delivery. Ordered delivery is something that we already studied. It gives us FIFO delivery. And it gives us reliable delivery, which is something we're going to study in about five minutes, if I don't run this out of time. And uh, in, if I want reliable FIFO delivery, I just want to guarantee that if Alice sends, says, I want to send a message M, eventually Bob receives <laughs> So you see how this is a slightly different problem than can Zod and Lee co-agree to attack at the same time? This is a problem that is sort of two-sided. Zod needs to have certainty that Lee will attack, and Lee needs to have certainty that Zod will attack. So we can always come up with a protocol that gets certainty sort of on one side, and then we have to add another message to get on the other side. So, you know, if Alice just needs to get a message to Bob, Alice can keep sending the damn message until such time as she gets an acknowledgement, and then she's done. Bob doesn't necessarily, you know, this is all about Alice's state of knowledge. TCP essentially allows the sender to have some kind of certainty about the receipt 
of a message. TCP would never allow two parties to establish something like simultaneous. TCCP. Okay. So I kind of just showed you, but let's do it anyway. Um, Question. Yeah. So suppose you had a Byzantine fault tolerant model, would that be able to solve this problem? Sorry? If you had a Byzantine fault tolerant system, would that be able to solve this consensus problem? Well, absolutely not. So so this, this consensus problem didn't assume the existence of a protocol at all. It chose a model, the omission model. And it said, let's say you were in the omission model. And then it stated a problem, simultaneous attack. Or, you know, si simultaneous agreement, really, which is a form of consensus. That's right, I'm spelling agreement wrong. Agreement. Okay? And the question was does a protocol exist that solves this problem in this model? The answer is no. And because the Byzantine model is strictly stronger, this result implies that no protocol solves the simultaneous agreement problem in the Byzantine model either. Now, might it solve it in the crash model? Maybe. Yeah. Oh yeah? Yeah. <laughs> so Z, Zog, and Lee both build catapults. <laughs> and they they fling each fling a messenger or a ball or an uh, uh, elastic ball over, over the hill. And because of the laws of physics, you know that if your ball gets comes back, then Lee had to send one and, and Yeah, okay. So I mean that's basically like you're you you're 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 solving the problem by changing the rules, which is a thing that Google does a lot, actually. So that's like, Span Spanner solves a lot of impossibilities by, by just sort of changing the rules. Um, reliable, reliable delivery. Process P sends a message Process Q and not all messages are dropped. Q eventually delivers. Is that? Hmm? Safety. Safety, why? Why? Yeah. Well, we should ask ourselves when we're trying to decide what kind of property something is. Let's imagine a world in which this property was violated. Right? How would we know it was violated? Is there a discrete point? No, right? Because it says, I mean, I could have written it without the word eventually, but I was trying to give you a hint. You know, because it has a word eventually in it. There's no, there's no deadline. So you can't point to a finite execution and be like, behold. Because look, like, even if you forget about omissions, right? If, if we thought that this were a safety property, we might suspect, you know, like, we'd be like, oh, this message is like really slow. We'd pick some point on this line and we're like, aha! It shall never be delivered. You know? That doesn't work. Right? We need to show an infinitely long line to show. So it's a live response. Is reliable delivery solvable in the omission model? I hope so. I hope so. What do y'all think? What would you do? So, if they're not all messages are dropped, <laughs> flaws basically mean you never have a complete network shutdown? Yeah, I mean, so if you didn't say this, then you're going to have to get fussy in your definition of the omission model and say, like, in the omission model, messages can be dropped, but not all of them. <laughs> right? Because if you, if you, it's going to turn out that fault tolerance properties are always going to be written in this sort of defensive way. 
And in fact, for most of the fault tolerance properties that we're going to study in this class, not this one, I'm going to write them in this really sort of, um, uh, it, using this particular convention in which I have sort of a precondition implies a postcondition. And so the precondition is going to look like it was possible to succeed, right? Success, right? If it was possible to succeed, then you will succeed. That's like the correctness property. And then that way, if it wasn't possible to succeed, you hadn't violated your property. And if it was possible to succeed and you did the right thing, you hadn't violated your property. But if it was possible to succeed, you, so you might have rewritten this and said, you know, if not all messages are dropped, then if a process P sends a message out in process Q, Q eventually delivers F. Right? And if I hadn't said that first part, P, then there would have been this one execution where all the messages were dropped, and Q did not eventually deliver F. And so in general, whenever we have omissions, because there could be infinitely many omissions, we're going to need to have, you know, you know what we sometimes call this is like a non-triviality clause, right? Because in a world in which it wasn't possible to do something good, protocols are trivially or vacuously correct. Does that make sense? Okay. So, I'll throw a lamp or diagram later. So let's imagine Alice is trying to get a message she bought. How might she do so reliably? TCP. TCP. Okay, but we, we haven't studied TCP. Yeah? Uh, what if she just continues sending a message over and over again until she gets it? Yeah, yeah, so let, let's, let's do something like this. Let's say, first thing Alice is going to need to do is she's going to need to implement some kind of buffer to hold the message. She can't just fire it off, because then she might lose it. So she's going to put her message in a buffer. Right? And then she's going to die. Oh, I was wondering, so are we not taking into account the fact that uh, Q could go down or, or, or P could go down in terms of uh, <coughs> like if the machine goes down, then the message won't be delivered, correct? Right? Yeah, so I should have, yeah, I guess you're right. I should have. It would fall under like not all messages dropping. Right? Not, not exactly, though. I mean, I, I should have been more careful on how I wrote it. You're right. I mean, it, it probably should, like P here, the, the non-triviality property should have said and Q is up. Uh, if we want to be totally strict, because, you know, or and Q is correct, or something like that. You're right. Um, so we need a buffer. And we're also going to need a clock, a timer. <coughs> and so the protocol is going to look like this. Periodically, when our timer ticks, I don't know if that is every couple hundred milliseconds or something, or every second, or something like that, we're going to go ahead and ship a message over the network. And we're going to ask Bob, when he gets the message, to send anything off. Now, as we know, because omissions can occur, that execution might end up looking like this. The tick happens. Oh, shoot. Tick happens again. Oh, nuts. But if eventually one makes it across, then Bob sends an acknowledgment. And then Alice can go ahead and clean up that buffer. And if she cleans up that buffer, then never, the message will never get sent. Right, so Alice is only actually, she has a clock, she has a buffer, she has an algorithm that says, periodically if something's in the buffer, send it. If you get an acknowledgement, delete the thing that's in the buffer. That's all she needs to do. Right? And then the timer will drive retransmission of that message infinitely in the event that that message is dropped infinitely many times. So eventually, as long as one message gets through, the message is going to be delivered at Bob. Yeah. Wait, um, I'm a little confused with the statement. Uh, you said P sends a message M, but the last part says Q eventually delivers M. Right. So why is Q delivering the message if P is already delivering the message M? Wait. Well, P isn't sending the message to itself, right? No, P is sending it to Q, right? Right. But why is Q sending it back to P? Where are you seeing something about Q sending it's, it to It P? says Q eventually delivers M, but right. to itself. Oh, itself? Yeah, what's delivery mean in this class? Remember, remember we talked about, remember we talked about um, delivery protocols are always going to distinguish between an event that sends a message, the receipt of a message, and then the possibly deferred delivery of the 
the message. Oh. I have to receive it. Okay. Right? I can't deliver a message at somebody else any more than I would want to send a message to myself. Now, in practice, I might want to send a message to myself. But I certainly can't deliver a message to another person. Three hours delivered to two. Right? Um, does anybody see any problems with this protocol, or are we done? Yeah. Uh, two messages in a row have to deliver because the acknowledgement could drop and then A keeps delivering. Uh, that's true, but uh, but that you know that, that's sort of outside the scope of our you know only one message needs to get through to satisfy our property. But you're right that two messages need to get through to not do something unnecessary forever. Uh, but that's sort of outside the scope of our, uh, of our property. Any other any other uh, concerns about this protocol? If the acknowledgement gets dropped. Oh, well, good 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 point. What happens in the event that the acknowledgement gets wrong? And more acknowledgements get sent until eventually. So I'm going to argue that that's true, that can happen. But we're not going to write any extra protocol, and indeed TCP doesn't write any extra protocol to deal with this case, because this is indistinguishable from the case when the message got dropped. Right? Just keep, actually, it's not completely indistinguishable. Interesting. Maybe this is a good time. No, it isn't a good time. Uh, no, we got it. We got it. Um, I want to show you something fun. Yeah, there's no time to get into reliable delivery, so I'm going to show you something fun. All right, I'm going to draw this picture from the draw picture. And this is going to be a chance for me to talk a little bit about item code. It doesn't exactly fit here, but I'm not really sure where it fits anyway. You know? So what's nice about this is that this is the picture that sort of one of you had this question about like, yeah, like why doesn't TCP solve the two team, or solve um, the two generals? And what is the relationship between the two generals and reliable delivery? And I think there is a relationship between the two generals and reliable delivery. I'm trying to illustrate to you now. now remember, I said if we're doing reliable delivery. Alice is going to put messages in a buffer driven by a clock, right? And uh, periodically, Alice sends the message. Bob sends an acknowledgement. Here's the problem. What if the downstream processing from Bob is non item potent? That means, all right, well, what's item potent? You say a function f is item potent if f of x is same as f of f of x is the same as f of f of f of x. Right? The number of times we apply the function has no effect on the end result or the end effect. Okay? So for example, assigning a value to a variable is item code. If I say x equals 3, x equals 3, x equals 3, that's the same as saying x equals 3. Incrementing a variable, however, does not have the property that it's item code. If I accidentally increment a variable twice rather than once, I'm going to have an unexpected result. Right? What else isn't item code? Well, tons of shit. Like, <laughs> what? Well, like, uh, you know, uh, uh, sending an email is not item code. Uh, usually. Uh, you know, sending flowers is not item code. Sending a missile is not item code. Printing a piece of paper is not item code. Yeah. Would you argue that vector clocks are not idempotent? Effective clocks? Vector clocks are not idempotent if you're incrementing on sending a message. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if you're basically anything that does counters, if you're not guarding what you count, is potentially non idempotent. Now, we might not care about vector clocks not being idempotent. It would depend about what the downstream processing was. Like, if we over counted, right. as long as we still understood the causal relations, right. if the exact numbers weren't right, we might not care. We might not care. Um, so, tons of shit is not item code. It could cost us money if we do more than once. It could be bad. It could be bad, right? So, what can we do to prevent this? Like, this thing prints, and we don't want it to print something more than once. Well, oh yeah, right, sorry, before I even go there. What's the concern? Well, the concern is, remember, this is an asynchronous network. So, Alice's timer might tick again before she gets the acknowledgement that she was going to get. Which means she goes ahead and sends the message redundantly, even though there was no loss. Right? That will surely happen in an asynchronous network. Because there would just be executions in which this first message just takes forever, and so another message gets out. 
So it's not that reliable delivery necessarily in an asynchronous network sometimes delivers the message more than once. Necessarily. There's no way around that. Reliable delivery is sometimes called at least once delivery. As opposed to at most once delivery, which is like send and track. Right? So it's easy to achieve at most once delivery. You send it, or you, it's really easy to achieve at most once delivery. You just don't send it. <laughs> it's fairly easy to achieve at least once delivery. You send it multiple times with acknowledgments. But you're gonna, you're gonna screw up. So what could you do? What could you do to prevent it? Yeah. Uh, you put numbers on it. Okay, I put numbers on it. Then what? So this one was message one, and this was message. One, good, okay, good, yeah. So they have to have the same identity so that we can know what to do with this. But then what? Acknowledge one. I didn't hear it, so, so. So like if message one was uh, received by B. So how does B know if message one was received? If it receives a message with the number one. Good, so I'm just gonna forget about the number one because it's an optimization. Because M, the message M, Presumably, one was just a digest of it anyway, right? So, all I need, like, like forgetting about storage for a moment, uh, all I need to do is remember that M was delivered abstractly. So, I, I'm right there with you. We would use a number in practice, yeah. but you know. So, what does that mean? Well, remember, and this is kind of cosmic for me uh, Alice used a buffer to hold M to drive retransmission. She used a buffer to make the messages be sent more than once, to cause redundancy or duplication. Right? Because that was how she overcame loss. Redundancy is sort of a uh, 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 medicine <laughs> for loss, right? It can, it, can, it, can, it can reduce the effects of loss, right? So she used a buffer to make something happen more than once. The problem is, is that sometimes it happens more than once when we don't want it to. So what you're suggesting is, oh, well, Bob could use like a dual buffer to suppress redundancy. That's kind of cool. That's like, that's like a mirror image. So now, so Bob gets a message, and when he, when he receives the message, he checks his buffer. And if the message isn't in the buffer, he delivers it. And if the message is in the buffer, he pretends he never saw it. Right? So a buffer to make things happen more than once, and a buffer to prevent things from happening more than once. That's dope. So does that mean that we have now achieved the elusive Exactly once delivery? Exactly once delivery is impossible under these circumstances. It's a corollary of the two generals. Why do I say that? Well, the difficulty is that in order for Bob to implement item potency by remembering things in a buffer, he has to remember them forever. And so he's going to run out of them. This is not a scalable protocol, because you have to remember every message he's ever delivered. Or does he? Well, he could ask Alice to send him an ACK ACK. <laughs> this is an ACK. And this is an ACK ACK. <laughs> and the ACK ACK could alert Bob that Alice knows, that Bob knows about the message. And if Al Bob knows that Alice knows that Bob got the message, then Bob knows Alice won't send the message again. This is kind of like that causal delivery protocol that y'all came up with, right? That's dope. And then if that happened, he got the ACK ACK, he could delete the message. And we have achieved exactly once delivery. Oh my god, we should publish right away. <laughs> we thought that couldn't be done. Damn it. So but what if the ACK ACK <laughs> was? And it's not going to get sent again because Alice cleans up her stuff when she gets the ACK. Oh, I know. So we can put another buffer over on Alice, <laughs> and then we can have an, another message, and then we can have an ack, 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 ack. And then you see how this is the two generals. Right? So two generals does have a sort of corollary in the reliable delivery space, but, but not in the sense of the one way Alice knowing that the message got sent, but in the whole story about being able to achieve exactly one's delivery without using infinite storage space. And so that's cool. So by doing that, I ran out of time, I'm out of time. But I got to do two impossibility results in one day. Thanks, everybody.